Let's get our definition straight here. You can't lump all occurrences of uh, non-equal treatment into the category of identity politics. Identity politics is a very specific thing. It's really only existed since the 1970s. You can't go back into to 1770 and say that the founders of the American Constitution were playing identity politics. They were you playing might politics that, that was based on identity. That's my definition of identity that's politics. That's not the definition of identity politics unless you pay, play fast and loose with the definition. Identity politics is something that's... Im no one talked about identity politics 20 years ago or 30 years ago. It's a new term. You, you can't say that people's proclivity to identify with their group is identity politics. That's just tribalism. And that's like, who knows how old that is? A million years old. 500,000 years old. And you're going to call tribalism identity politics? Well, that's not helpful. If you want to talk about tribalism, we could talk about tribalism. But identity politics is something that's nested inside a particular political view of the world. It's got a Marxist basis, and it manifests itself in postmodernism. And it emerged in the American Union, France first in the 1970s, and then has swept through the American universities and increasingly the rest of the West since then. That's identity politics. If you want to talk about tribalism, that's fine. I'm not a fan of tribalism, which is why I don't like the identity politics types. And I don't care if they're on the right or the left. I think the right-wing use of identity as the primary marker for human categorization is as reprehensible and dangerous as it is on the left. My problem with the left at the moment, the fundamental problem with the radical left, is that they're hyper-dominant in academia. And that's not good. And that's not my opinion. You can go look at Jonathan Haidt's data and see for yourself. And he's as moderate a person as you could hope to find. And probably less prone to anger than me. And, and I agree with you. I find a lot of students phenomenally irritating. But I would question how much power they have it's in contrast the to the things that I find more worrying that are happening in the world today, right? Or even the professors, right? Even Look, the professors. 20 year olds don't have that much power, but they're not 20 forever. 10 years later, they're 30. And, and 20 years later, they're 40. Right. And, and whatever happens in the university happens everywhere five years later. And very, very sadly for people in my politics, left wing politics, what happens to people as they get older is that they've traditionally got more conservative. Mm -hmm. So I don't think you can make a case that the, the, the current, where people are with their 20 today is actually going to be the ideology that takes them all the way through their life. That's never been the case so far. No, but so it'll, be lo it'll be around long enough to do plenty of damage, like it already is. Okay, but so. even if we accept that students and their POMO professors are quite annoying, which I think is probably I agree, something I it's agree not, with They're not on. just annoying. Like, they're destroying the universities, and that's not a good thing. And they're particularly destroying the social sciences and the humanities. The sciences are safe so far, but not for long. Because the scientists in particular are terrible at politics and the left-wing activists are great at politics. And so they'll win eventually. The National Science Foundation is already introducing diversity requirements for hiring in mathematics in universities. It's like, good luck with that. That's not going to work. There are hardly any mathematical geniuses. If you start putting all sorts of arbitrary restrictions on their hiring, you're just going to not end, you're going to end up not finding the ones that there are. So... Besides, I don't think that's true, world? actually, because if you say there are very few yeah, mathematical but what do you know about it? Well, I'm, I want next year I'm going to be a fellow at Oxford University, so I spend time talking to academics. I've talked to a lot of academics for my book. I do agree with you, there is an illiberal strain that is sweeping through a lot of universities. I don't think it's an existential threat, and I certainly don't think it is, to me, the biggest issue in world politics today. It's the one that I would choose personally. What do you think is the biggest issue? I think that the rise of strongmen, authoritarians around the world is very worrying, and that's one of the reasons that I find the subtitle of your book it fascinating. Is very because you're, it's called An Antidote to Chaos. Mm -hmm. Why isn't it an antidote to order? Which which you also say in its excessive manifestations is bad. I've said that, well, you can't write a book about everything. No, 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 but you've specifically chosen an antidote to chaos. Yeah, so why is chaos the big... I 300 lectures online, and I talk plenty about the pathology of order in those lectures. Okay, but so I'm just I'm saying... I'm no fan of authoritarian strongmen, that's for sure. Well, that's good, but I do think that the way that you talk about order in the book is something that people will take away from it. Be specific. Okay, so let me think. Um, the way that you talk about natural dominance hierarchies in lobsters. Let's get on to the lobsters. Because I think that the, the, the thing that people take away from that is male lobsters compete for female lobsters, and that says something about society now, that's, that men need to be dominant in, in society. Because if lobsters do it, then there is something that we can read about humans from There's that There's nothing too. in that chapter at all that suggests that the way that men should succeed in human hierarchies is a consequence of the exercise of power. There's not one line in that entire book that's, that claims that, because it's not what I believe. 
Most human hierarchies, as I already pointed out, are hierarchies of competence, not power. Okay, so That's why we don't live in a patriarchal tyranny. And so if you want to be a successful man, then you should be competent. And that will move you up the hierarchy. And that will make you attractive, and for good reason. Unless you want an incompetent mate, which is possible and, and, and happens, but isn't something that I would recommend. People will sometimes choose an incompetent mate because they're intimidated by competence. And so they'll settle for someone who they don't respect because they feel that they can master them and they won't be intimidated. But it's not a recipe for a happy life, I can tell you that. So there isn't a line in that chapter that talks about power as, as, as the proper means of conducting yourself in life. There's not a line in the book, and there's nothing in anything I've ever said that suggests that. Okay, no, I'm... So yeah, but it's really important, because people have read this chapter, and they make exactly the argument that you make. And it's a misapprehension. So, it's a, it's a misapprehension of the book. Okay, but if, if so many people are getting the same misapprehension, could it there, be there possible... There aren't so many people that oh. are getting it. There's two million people that have bought the book, and there's a very small handful of people who have a particular ideological perspective who enjoy developing that perspective because it indicates just what sort of reprehensible individual I am. But it has absolutely nothing to do with what I wrote or what I've said or what I believe. I don't believe that our fundamental hierarchies are based on power. I don't believe that the way that you move up our hierarchies is as a consequence of manifesting power. It's competence. Okay. My mm. big problem with the lobsters is mm. that it's scientifically bollocks, right? It's just you cannot read across from lobsters and what they do to what humans do. Of course do. you can. That's why serotonin works on lobsters. But it works you in two different ways. So if serotonin makes lobsters more aggressive, it makes humans no, it makes them less more dominant. aggressive. Right? That's no, what happens. No, that's not right. That, that serotonin makes human beings more dominant but less aggressive. And the only reason it makes them more dominant is because they're less irritable and they're less defensively aggressive. So it's not bollocks. I know my neurochemistry. So if you're going to play neurochemistry, let's go and do it. Okay, well you say antidepressants work on lobsters. Yes, they do. In they make a lobster that's been defeated in a fight more likely to fight again. That's not the same mechanism that it's happens the same in mechanism. humans. Yes, it is. Because lobsters don't get mechanism. depressed as the way that humans are. I think you're anthropomorphizing into a ridiculous degree. These are I creatures that, that urinate out of their faces. I think that... Uh, the fundamental issue among um, knowledgeable uh, animal behaviorists is that anthropomorphization with animals is generally the appropriate tactic unless you have reason to doubt it, which is because there's continuity between us and animals rather than discontinuity. And the idea that the anthropomorphization of animals is inappropriate is something derived from 1950s behaviorism. The, the, the highly trained affective neuroscientists and people who study motivation and emotion as well as neurochemistry know perfectly well that there is biological and behavioral continuity across the animal kingdom and way down into the kingdom as well, which is exactly why I chose lobsters, to indicate that there is so much continuity in the systems that allow us to estimate a status position that we share it with creatures that are a third of a billion years old. And the reason that I made that argument was to put paid at least into part, in part to the absurd Marxist proposition that hierarchical structures are a secondary consequence of Western civilization and free market economies, which is as preposterous a perspective as you could possibly develop about anything. Hierarchies are a third of a billion years old. You can't blame them on the West or men or capitalism. And we're wired for hierarchical perception in ways that you can po hardly possibly imagine. Even our ability to rank order a set of objects seems to be tightly linked to our ability to assess the relative status of people in our, in our social uh, milieus. So, and the biochemistry is very, very similar. And the reason we know that is because most of the drugs that are used on people are first tested on animals. Now, it's not often animals as primitive as lobsters, but it is plenty. So a lot of what we know about neurological structure, for example, is a consequence of studying the flat room worm, which is a much more primitive organism than the lobster. Continuity is the, is the rule. Okay, so what can we learn from killer whales that live in matriarchal pods often led by uh, a, a grandmother, someone who's been through a menopause? Why isn't that an example that you've picked to talk about in the book? It's because lobsters say the thing that ideologically you want to talk about, which is your belief that there is a kind of Marxist ideology How do lobsters sweeping? say that? The point that I was making, the point that I was making with lobsters, I just said what it was. That hierarchies have been for a ver around for a very long time. But who genuinely, time. really, today is arguing, apart from maybe three mad Marxist academics, that there is no such thing as hierarchy? Hierarchies. They're not. A, they're not arguing exist. that there's no such thing as hierarchy. Oh, there they're should be no such thing as hierarchies. Oh, there are plenty of them are arguing really? that. Really? Because I see that almost never in the wild. 
as an, as an argument. I see people think that, that hierarchy should be based on merit and what they should be think, more equal. What do you equal? think the demand for equality of outcome is if it's not an attempt to flatten hierarchies or to, to eliminate them? What else could it possibly be? And you don't think the neo-Marxists and the postmodernists think that hierarchy is a social construction? Like, you're not talking about the same people that I know, right. that's for sure. Everything's a social construction for the social constructionists, including hierarchies. But I just don't think that is a very widely held view in the world. It might be among it's, it's liberal 20%, arts universities. 20% of social scientists identify as Marxist. And, uh, and the where's, that, where's that statistic from? Look it up, on, look it up in, in Heights' work. Okay. Well, you, no, no, I mean, I'm, I'm interested. I know, I, I've checked it out quite yeah, carefully. Yeah, yeah, but I'm just... It's I'm a so perfectly valid statistic. I don't have the reference at hand. Yeah. So it's one in five, okay? And the, the number of conservatives, or even liberals for that matter, in the social sciences and humanities is not only vanishingly small, but getting smaller. And you, you think the social constructionists believe that hierarchy is built into biology? They're not very good social constructionists if, that was, if that's what they believe. And the postmodernists and the neo-Marxists are radical social constructionists because they wouldn't believe that human beings are infinitely malleable and, and, and that we can be recreated in, in whatever image the ideologues might want to recreate us in if they didn't think that. And it's much more prevalent than you're admitting. I mean, there, these, there isn't a competing position on campuses except among the evolutionary biologists and the evolutionary psychologists, let's say, and they're under com complete attack. They're certainly next on the chopping block, as far as I can tell. I've been warning them for the last two years. Social constructionists don't like evolutionary psychologists, and they don't like biology. And I, I, I really don't understand why, except that it interferes with this idea that human beings are infinitely malleable and stops them from being able to blame hierarchy on the West. Look, if you're really concerned about the poor, as a, as a social democrat, let's say, the first thing you should do is abandon your presupposition that the dispossession produced by hierarchies is a consequence of the patriarchal structure of the West. It's a way deeper problem than that. So there have been people wait, wait, who have been dispossessed forever, way before capitalism. Okay, I, I think I would agree with that. So if, if it is a way deeper problem than that, how do you tackle it? I don't know. Well, that's a bit... I mean, that, for someone as intelligent as you that just throw their hands up and go, ooh, maybe some There's people are just There's lots of things I don't know poor. how to tackle. I don't know how to tackle the fact that people range, range extremely widely in their cognitive ability either. These are big problems. Right, but, but we I could know. start with a redistributive tax policy, right, where people who earn a lot pay more tax than people lower down the income scale to redistribute income. That was a fairly obvious way that you could make poor people less poor. It's something that, you know, the Labour government did. They almost, I think they halved child poverty. It is possible to do things, and we do have mechanisms. Well, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, make the immediate uh, presumption that it was the redistributive tax policy that halved child poverty. You know that absolute poverty in the world has halved between the year 2000 and 2012, and you can't attribute that to redistributive policies. No, I can't. I'm only talking about Britain. I'm talking about that particular government, which had, you know, f then there are fiscal analyses that have been done. But I think, um, let's move on from, from lobsters. I mean, mm. uh, you know. That chapter is about people becoming responsible and competent, not about them becoming like dominant and powerful. Okay, it's no, not that at all. But my problem with it is I think you got criticized by a lot of marine biologists, right, and by a lot of geneticists for it. I think one. It. Okay, well, I can name you. P.Z. Myers is one who's mm -hmm. criticised you. Um, Adam Rutherford, who's former editor of Nature, has criticised that look, chapter. There are, you know, that look, is not... But what I think no is fascinating is that... No reasonable biologists dispute the fact that most or organisms organise themselves into hierarchies and that the fundamental biological mechanism for the regulation of hierarchy is the serotonin system. That's not disputable. Now, you can find animal organisational structures that vary from that, from that, what would you call it, fundamental pattern. But the existence of variance isn't proof against the existence of a fundamental pattern. Like, I don't, I don't know how you can sit there and be skeptical about this. If you know the literature on hierarchical structure, you understand that across the entire animal kingdom, animals tend to organize themselves into hierarchies. But and, very, that the right. and that the neurochemistry but very of the different types of energy. hierarchies, right? So well, there's a you pattern. Have, and that's chimps, why we know they're hierarchies. Right. Yeah, but that, the pat, like you say, the pattern is if that the, the, you know the, the the hierarchy is the pattern. Right. Okay, and that's fine. So chimps have one very obvious social structure, and bonobos have another. It's not one. as different as people have made it out to be. No. The bonobos are a lot more violent than the right, than and they're the, not uh, hippie monkeys, Lusoian right? Observers of the bonobos have admitted. Okay, but nonetheless, you say that as if the details, those little details, don't matter, as if they can't be 
such a thing as a, a hierarchy that is much worse than another hierarchy. That's my problem. I'm not with saying it. that at all. There's clearly hierarchies that are worse than other hierarchies. Right. Baboons have terrible hierarchies, for example. And I'm and saying tyrannical that. hierarchies aren't my cup of tea. Right. That isn't the point I was making. No. The point I was making was that hierarchies can't be blamed on capitalism or the West. They're built into our biology. The the neuro the neurochemistry is so old that we share it with with uh, crustaceans, so that's a third of a billion years, which is the proof that hierarchies aren't a recent construct, if proof like that needs to be needed, needs to be provided, and that the best way for people to adopt a, uh, uh, a strategy that will move them up the hierarchy, which is a desirable thing in most regards, is to face the suffering of the world forthrightly. That's what that chapter is about. And the pe people who've been criticizing it uh, read it as if it's a defense of the Western patriarchy. It's like there's there's no defense of the Western no, patriarchy. No, I don't think that, that's true. I think the way that chapter. people criticize it is the, and I think this happens a lot with evolutionary psychology, is a, uh, which is not quite what the lobsters are, but is where other stuff in the book is. Uh, other things you said, for example, like uh, women wear rouge because it reminds men of ripe fruit. Right, well, for a start. Well, why do you think women wear rouge? I have absolutely no idea. But right, I will right. Tell that's really not a very good answer. Well, yeah, you said before there were lots of things you don't know the answer to. But I'll tell yeah, you one but thing. You're, I'm Most not criticizing your perspective on this. You're criticizing mine, so I'm presuming okay, you have an alternative idea. Why, women, why do you think we're, women wear makeup? Why, I, why do I you think, think they're an enormous... Not, but let me, let's, let's go back to why women wear rouge, because it reminds men of ripe fruit. Okay, for, first of all, not all ripe fruit is red. Uh, why would you, you want know, to... Do you want to... color vision to detect ripe fruit. Do you, you want to eat women? No. I think unless men are having sex you with might ripe fruit... You taste them. That's not really what... And where is the evidence that women who are redder in the cheeks are more have more offspring? What do you think happens during the sexual flush? But that's the key point, isn't it? Is that you would expect, actually, if this is a, a, a sexual selection, that women who are yeah, redder would have more children. One of we the would get progressively of, redder over time. One of the hallmarks of youthful skin is the proclivity for it to flush red. And yes, youth, youthful women have more children. It's a primary sign of fertility. That, I think you're using... What, wait a second here. What do you think women wear makeup for? Come on, if you're going to go after me on this... Okay. Let, let, let's, let's, let women... People say, well, women wear makeup to feel better about themselves. That's it's not a very deep analysis. Why makeup? I'll tell why you, facial makeup? I'll tell you why I wear makeup, which mm -hmm. is to stop the comments that I would get if I didn't wear makeup. And my gender, I always say, my gender is low maintenance, right? I don't feel particularly like a woman inside. I don't really know what that would mean. But what I try and do is try and look... You know, in the same way that you get black women who talk about the problem with natural hair is it's seen as unprofessional, right? And as a woman, if you don't wear makeup, that is seen as a political choice. That is seen as something that, you know, you are... So you wear makeup to protect yourself from, from what? From, from tyrannical judgment. men? No, no, but and, and tyrannical women as well, I would say. I think women very harshly judge each other's appearance and there are very good reasons for that. It's but probably because they've learned that from oppressive men. No, I don't think so. I don't. Well, think why do you think it is then? I think that, that women are encouraged to be seen as being in competition with each other. Encouraged? You don't think that there's anything about that that's natural, eh? Well, um, uh, I would be reluctant to get into that because I, I, I think you could talk about sex, intersexual competition. I think that's a very big deal among the social sciences and, and evolutionary science. It's not my particular competence. But yeah, I wouldn't. My conception of the patriarchy is not that men are beastly to women. It is that there is a structure in which women participate too that overall privileges and benefits men in order to control female reproduction. And I think yeah. those are two very different things.